Hello there, my brothers and sisters in Christ. I pray that you all are doing well once again and that you're still pushing forward in the faith and still remaining obedient to the word of Jesus Christ, our Savior, and patiently waiting for his return and still living according to the will of the Father. And I pray that you all are doing well, no matter what you're going through, that you're being strong and Remaining in the faith and just pushing through. Alright, brethren, I wanted to share with you all um, an important video that I was meaning to share with you all a few months ago. But it just came to my mind today while I was at work. Um, so I wanted to share uh, it with you today. So the reason I'm going over slightly the book of Esther with you because of uh, because of its importance why because it reveals the future of the body of christ it reveals our future all right when um i say it reveals our future as we go on through the video you would begin to see and understand and with it it actually opened up my eyes to where if i didn't study the uh, book of esther i would have never known uh, something that was revealed in the book of Esther that I read somewhere else in scriptures and it was the Lord that actually pointed me to the book of Esther Okay, so there was a time While I was driving and I was driving long distance And at times when I'm driving long distance, I like to listen to the audio Bible since I can't read the Bible um, itself so as I was driving I said to myself what should I listen to because I said to myself, I've listened to all the chapters, so what should I listen to? So that day, I'm not sure what I ended up listening to, to be honest with you. But that night, I was asleep, and I heard the voice of the Lord whisper to me, verbatimly, he said, the book of Esther. And it, I held on to that. It stuck with me, and I know it was the Lord that made it stick because there's times we would dream something and we would forget but it stuck with me so as i was tossing and turning throughout the night or whatnot i kept it's just it stayed with me to where i verbatimly said i'm gonna read the book of esther when i get up i'm gonna read the book of esther when i get up i just kept saying that until i got up um and before getting up i had this dream where my bible was in front of my face and the book of esther was opened up right in front of me and the pages were clean. It was white. I mean, the letterings were there of the chapters and the verses or whatnot. But my writings showing that I have been studying it, it wasn't, there was no writing. And that's how true it was in my, in scriptures, in my Bible, in reality. So the Lord was showing me that, okay, you may have read the book of Esther a few times, but you haven't diligently studied it. Okay. See, the thing is, in my mind, the book of Esther and the book of Ruth, I seen it as equivalent to the Song of Solomon. I knew it was somewhat of importance, but I didn't see it. It's just to my ignorance, brethren. I just didn't see it as important as like the book of Daniel or Matthew, Mark, and Luke or the book of Revelation. I just didn't see it as that, but the Lord showed me that. And as I read it, it is important. It, it, it reveals our future. Um, so after that, I um, listened to it a few times on the audio Bible to, and meditated on it. Read it a few times and just read it over and over and over and seen a few things and which the Lord was showing me. Also did a uh, Bible study with my sister in Christ back at that time and we discussed a few things on there as well um so let's begin so with the book of esther for those who haven't read it there's four yeah four main characters i would say four or five but the fifth one is not is not really a main character so the first character we have as you were is the king the king of the providence um of Shushan the palace, uh, which it says in scriptures that he reigned from India to Ethiopia over 127 providences. All right, and then we have Mordecai, which is known to be a Jew, 
We have Esther, who is also known as Adassa. We know that Esther in the scripture is Mordecai's cousin. For Mordecai's uncle, this uh, Esther is Mordecai's uncle's daughter. Who it doesn't say in scripture how her parents died, but um, Mordecai, her cousin, basically raised her. Uh, we also have this main, main, main character, which is Haman. Okay, Haman is the main character that we're going to be talking about um, in this video. And for some of you who have seen the movie, and I've seen this movie when I was in my flesh, um, Green Mile. Let me see if I can bring his bring him up, but he reminds me of Haman. <clears throat> All right, for some of you who already got it, it's Percy from Green Mile. For those who have seen the movie, if you read the book of Esther, you would agree that that's exactly who he reminds me of. So if they did a video and they made him to be Haman, perfect, perfect match. Okay. And also the fifth character would have been Vashti's, but uh, and that's the wife of King Ahasuerus, where I was the ex-wife of King Ahasuerus. I wish she got booted out because of her disrespect and um dishonor dishonoring the king, not only dishonoring the king, disrespect and um her defiance against him. <coughs> so um so speaking about what happened to King uh Queen Vashtis, so there was a time in the uh in Shushan the palace the king Hazuerus, he um he made a feast unto all of his princes and his servants and the nobles and princes of the providences and basically this feast was to show off all of his riches and his glorious kingdom and the honor of his excellent majesty for what is it said a few days about a hundred and it says four score days so that about like a three four months or whatnot I said to myself, that's a long feast. But, um, <clears throat> and then when those three months plus expired, he made another feast for, um, all the people that were in his presence in his palace, both where it says great and small, for like for seven days in the court of his garden. So, again, he just continued to show all the, uh, the glory of his kingdom. Uh, he invited the nobles, the princes, the chamberlains, and he was just having a good time. And he made sure that all who was invited had a good time as well. They were um, serving wine and music and food, and they were just having a good time. <clears throat> um, so in the few days of that uh a little second feast the king was merry in heart and full of joy and like i said he was just showing off he was just very i wouldn't say he was prideful in a uh evil way but just how kings normally are so in the joy of his heart he wanted to like almost uh what top it off top off all that he has and show off before his people um and what he wanted to do the last thing he wanted to do is show off his wife it says in the book of uh esther that his wife was really beautiful so he called his chamberlains to go get her because the thing is in it seems like in the book of esther that the men and the women were separate so there was the feast made so the wife or the queen made a feast for the women in the royal house but it was separate from the feast in which the king was at so the king had his chamberlains go fetch the queen from the other house where she was feasting with the women and she refused to come to him she refused <clears throat> and with her being refused she didn't realize that it would have cost her her uh, royal throne her her status because with what she did, she had made the king really angry. Not only angry, but it was an embarrassment to him before all of those whom he had invited because he wanted to show them everything in which he had. 
in a prideful way and she kind of ruined it. So one of his nobles, which were um, of the law, not the law of God, but their own law, the law of the Medes and the Persians. He said unto the king, what Queen Vastis has done was is very dangerous, and um, we shouldn't condone it. These these things should not be let go, but <clears throat> you should take her position away from her and appoint young virgins throughout your providence of your kingdom. That you may replace Queen Vashti's with another queen. For the sake of what the queen had done. If this isn't corrected. If this isn't checked. Then the women throughout the providence and the kingdoms. Will take advantage of this. And begin to look at their own husbands. With contempt. And basically treat them as. Vashti's has treated you. So they agreed to that. So the queen lost her position. And a search was uh, sent out to look for another queen. And that's where we get Adassa, which is also known as Esther. So with this calling. Now I, I kind of see because when I was in my flesh, I used to watch a lot of television. I used to watch. Um, there's one of them that me and my cousins would always get together and watch. And it was um, Flavor, Flavor of Love or Flavor of Flav. And um, what else? I Love New York, for those who know it and watch it. If you know the series and the drama and how they set things up, it reminds me of the book of Esther. Because you have a bachelor who goes and seeks out to find someone to marry. Throughout all parts of the providence of his kingdom. And that's what King Azurus had done after he um, cast away his wife as cheese. <clears throat> he basically did a royal call decree to bring young fair virgins to be sought for him. And these young fair virgins was uh, appointed, uh, appointed to be sought for by officers of his providence. So they gather all together, all the young virgins, unto the Shushan the palace, to the house of the women, <clears throat> to be purified and to be brought before the king. And whichever one pleased the king, that's who he would have chosen to be his wife. So when I, it just reminded me back of what I watched in, what is it, Flavor Flav or Flavor Love. That's what he did. So he reminded me of. The king who um, did a royal call. Well, it wasn't even a royal call. You could say a worldly call. <clears throat> and called um, different women throughout the world to come to his, well, it wasn't his home, but a mansion. And whomever at the end of the series or the show that he delighted, they were basically coupled up. So I kind of see why, where they got this from. It's funny how the world gets a lot of things from the scriptures. But so, um, fast forward, Esther becomes queen. And now we have what we see as um, Haman. Alright, so Esther becomes queen. Vast Jesus go and the king is happy. The king actually favors Esther a lot and he loved her more than all the other women. Like I know God gave her favor and she was really a humbled woman. Like she was brought up under the law of God, very humble and had the spirit of God on her. Therefore she had a favor with the king. So again, okay, okay, fast forward. Um Esther's queen to King Hazuerus. So there's this beef that goes on in the book of Revelation with Mordecai, her uncle or her cousin, and Haman. So Haman is an official of the king, one of the higher princes. In the book of Esther, Haman in his in his position reminded me of in the book of Daniel, Daniel's appointed position where Daniel was advanced over the other princes and the presidents. So this is the same position Haman was in 
in the book of Daniel. It says in the book of Daniel that the king appointed and advanced him and set him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. And then they were commanded by the king to bow and reverence Haman. But then there was something, I don't know why, but there was some something about Haman. Like I said, if you read the book of Esther, Haman is off. There's something that he wasn't normal. He seemed like this guy that he had his nose in the air. He wasn't humble whatsoever. He was very prideful. Pride of life. He was very conceited. And I mean, if the king allowed, he would have. I could very well see him even betraying the king and seeking to kill him. But um, something more. There's something about him and Mordecai I didn't like. So the king gave, like I said, the king gave commandment for everyone to bow and reverence more. Uh, Haman. But Mordecai, who sat in front of the, who sat in the gate of the king's palace, never gave Haman reverence. The first people that noticed that are the other princes that were with Haman before Haman did. And the princes said to Mordecai, "Why do you not reverence uh, Haman? For the for the king has given everyone a commandment when Haman enters the building for them to bow and reverence him. But when Haman would enter a building, or enter the building." Mordecai wouldn't need Mordecai would neither bow to him nor reverence him. Mordecai it, it, it seemed like Mordecai just ignored him. So Haman would enter a building, everyone bow, reverence him, greet him or whatnot, but Mordecai probably would turn the other cheek and just sit down and act like he's nothing. So his princes went back and told Haman. Haman didn't notice that until the princes went back and told him. So he kind of observed it himself when he entered the room he tried he seen if Mordecai would bow and reverence him and he seen that he didn't and what what Mordecai had done made him really angry it says it said it made him wroth so at that time he sought to kill Mordecai because of that it says in scriptures in the scriptures that Haman is an enemy of the Jews and you would see why not only does Haman remind me of um, Percy in the movie Grey Mile, but he also reminds me of who the Lord has revealed unto us, his identity, uh, the Antichrist. He also reminds me of him as well. So since that time, it has just been beef between Mordecai and Haman. So throughout that time, Haman just sought to find some type of way to where he can kill him so in the meantime something occurred see it's like in the book of esther you would think it was a movie you would think that it wasn't something that was real that occurred but it's just the work of the lord so um there was a time where like I said, Mordecai mostly spent his time in front of the gate of the king's palace. I don't know if he had a job, but that's where he spent his time. And there was guards in front of the gate of the king. And these guards were angry and they were discussing one to another how they would plot to kill the king. And someone told Mordecai, Mordecai told Esther, and Esther had this checked out and they found out and they end up hanging those men on a tree and it was written in the book of chronicles that mordecai had um basically saved the life of the king but the king had not known that so that was something that was thrown in in scriptures okay trying to remember all right so there came a time like i said Haman just had beef with uh mordecai so there came a time where not only did Haman want to have 
Mordecai killed, but now he wanted to wipe off all the Jews in the providence in the kingdom in the kingdom of Hasuerus just to get back at Mordecai. This is how evil this guy was. One second. So in his vengeance, there came a day where Haman went up to the king Hasuerus and said to the king. I mean, he kind of deceived the king somewhat, and the king wasn't really paying attention. See, the king didn't know his wife was a Jew. He didn't. The king didn't know that um, Mordecai was related to Esther, whatnot. But later on, he knew. But so there came a time where Haman was still rocked and angry with uh, Mordecai. Like I said, in his mind, he wanted to have him be put to death. <coughs> So one day he came to the king, <clears throat> and I, as I was reading, I seen these things happening to the body of Christ as well, for us being separate from the kingdom. And this is how the Jews were. The Jews were separate from the ways of the people in the kingdom. All right, so Haman said to the king, he said, there are there is a certain people, and he's speaking about Jews, there is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the providence of your kingdom. And their laws are diverse from all the people. Neither do they keep your laws. Neither keep yeah, neither keep the king's laws. Therefore, Haman said to the king, he said, Therefore it is not the king's prophet to suffer them. Alright. And then he said, If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed. And he said, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver to the hands of those that have charge of the business to bring it into the king's treasuries. And like I said, the king just not thinking there. Just again, it reminds me of the book of Daniel with Darius signing the decree that no man may seek any God, any petition of anyone save the king for X amount of days. And Darius wasn't thinking when he signed a decree in which that decree went against Daniel and whom he loved. So it says, um, and the king took his ring from his hand and gave it unto Haman and the decree was signed. So a letter went out throughout all the providence of the king's palace to basically destroy kill cause to perish all jews both young and old little children and women in one day and to take their spoil for a prey and it says the copy of the writing was sent to all the providence and published unto all people that they should be ready against that day against the jews and they made haste for this writing to be sent forth so as I was reading that, I was like, man, that's a purge. That's like purging the kingdom of all professing believers. Because that's how, that's who the Jews were. It's like we as professing believers in this world, we don't hold on to the law of the land. But we hold on to the commandments of Jesus Christ, the doctrines, the teachings of Jesus Christ. We deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow after Christ. So imagine us being in the U.S. for those who are in the U.S. or wherever you are. There is a president or king or prince over that country. But the laws of the land we don't abide by. We abide by the laws of Christ. Of God. So we imagine the Antichrist himself. The Antichrist government being in the shoes of this Haman and because we don't bow down to the image of the beast we read in the book of uh, Revelation for those who do not let me see what it says in the book of Revelation I thought I had it memorized for whoever does not worship the image of the beast they should be killed all right like I said this is the reason the Lord showed me how important this is it's basically a, a mirror image of our future so 
in this case, in the book of uh, Esther, because of the Jews not subjecting themselves to the law of the land, there is a call to have them annihilated. All right. So when the when the letter went out to the palace to the providence, like I said, it's like a purge. If you've seen the movie Purge, it kind of reminds me of what will be done unto the professing believers in these last days. Knowing we got to understand that there is a greater persecution, the Holocaust coming unto the saints of God, though the believers of God. I mean, we see that in the Book of Revelation, the fifth seal, where the souls are crying crying out to the Lord, having been killed for what? For the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. It's the same as the Jews in the book of um, Esther. In the book of Revelation, the fifth seal, saw they, they, the souls that were killed, mortared, they cried out to the Lord, Sovereign Lord, saying, Sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long will you not judge and avenge our blood for what the people on earth are doing to us and then it says in in scriptures that um white robes were given to them mind you these are people that died white robes were given to them and they were told to rest for a little season until their fellow servants and their brethren are killed as they were be fulfilled and we know when that is fulfilled then the sixth seal is open and then there's an earthquake to where the earth is basically destroyed the people the captains the rulers they all hide in the rocks and in the mountains saying fall on us and hide us from the face of the one that sits upon the throne which is the father and then it says and from the face of the and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of the wrath has come and who shall be able to stand all right, so when the decree goes out, the letter goes out to all the providences, all the providences, the Jews see it. And it says there's a great mourning in the king in the in the palace of Shushan. It says um, when Mordecai received all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and bitter cry. And it came even before the king's gate. For none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And every and in every providence, whether so the king's commandment and his decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews, and fasting, and weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. Okay. So this is like if there was a this is like if there was a decree for all those who um, preach hate, and that hate is, in these last days, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. is that we should come against them. I mean, if you really look at what's going on, it's already coming to pass very soon. How soon? A few years. For, I mean, we look at this, what, um, what, is, what had been done. Or what was sought to be done to the Jews. But God intervened. What was sought to be done to the Jews. Is what would occur to the body of Christ. Because we refuse to worship the beast. And the image of the beast. And all this will occur. Under the inner faith dialogue. In which the world is seeking to merge religions. They're seeking to find some type of common ground. And um, many have seen. Even I had dreams where. Islam will be Islam will be part of that destruction of the saints. So it's like let's say they said they come out with a decree of those who preach hate. They could very well be talking about us, and then the decree goes about let them be given over and be killed. Many will mourn, just as the Jews mourned in their time. So with this decree going out, Esther had not known. So Mordecai had um. They basically had a middleman to tell them. They basically were speaking through a middleman, which which went back and forth to Esther and to Mordecai, and Mordecai let Esther know what was going on. And Mordecai, I mean Esther, had called for Mordecai 
to speak to the Jews to go on a three-day fast so that Esther may find favor to go speak to the king. For it is said that um, no one can just come up to the king's court without prior notice. If so, they are subject to be killed and that goes with the queen as well. So the king and the queen didn't see each other every day. So, um, the queen did not just want to come up to the queen to make her request. Instead, she had the Jews fast for her to she may find favor in the king's sight when she did come un uninvited or un unappointed so that she won't lose her life. So, they did a fast for three days and the Lord gave favor unto Esther to report to the king. And when she stepped before the king, the king found favor in her eyes. And he hold, he held up his gold scepter. And when he held up his gold scepter, he basically was telling them that don't kill her. She's okay with me or whatnot. So she approached him and she spoke to him. And he was glad to see her, actually. And he was saying, what, what would you like, Esther? What is your request? He said, I will give you half of my kingdom. What would you like? I mean, he liked, he loved her. And then she said, um, I made a feast that I want to invite you and Haman to. And then um, they came to the feast. And then again, he asked her, what was your petition? What was your request? And he said, well, she said, well, my request is that I make you a feast tomorrow and that you and Haman come to the feast and he said okay he said and then I would and then she said and then I will tell you what I um, am requesting so Haman gets big-headed with himself and he goes back home after the first feast joyful in his heart but then when he seen Mordecai sitting at the king's gate and he seen that Mordecai didn't stand up for him, nor reverenced him, nor moved from him, or nor moved for him, or bowed for him. Mordecai, in his heart, became very wroth, or had indignation against Mordecai, as it says in the word. But um, Haman ended up going home <coughs> and bragging to his wife and to um, his friends, his neighbors, or whatnot, and bragging about the glory of his riches and. Uh, multitude of his children i think it says in scripture he had about like seven or ten sons so he was bragging about them <clears throat> and how he was appointed by the king over all the other princes and how the king advanced him and how also tomorrow that the that there's a feast in which the queen invited him and it'll just be him and the king so he was just gloating over it but he said to himself, all of this stuff doesn't benefit me none, not until I see that a uh, Jew, Mordecai, did. <clears throat> and so what his friends had suggested <clears throat> with um, killing Mordecai, his friends suggested that they build a gallow. They said, let, let a gallow be made of 50 cubit high and tomorrow speak to the king that Mordecai be hanged on that gallow. And then after that, you can go merrily in into the feast with the king and the queen and have a good time. And you don't have to worry about this Mordecai anymore. But little to little to what they know, him know that God is working in the midst of everything, brethren. So while this is on the mind of Mordecai and they build the gallow in his home and everything. That same night, the king couldn't sleep, it said. So he commanded the book of the records of the Chronicles to be brought to him. And then that's where he read about what Mordecai had done when it came to Mordecai saving his life. Like I said about where he overheard or someone overheard the, um, the two guards before the king's gate were angry with the king and wanted to plot to kill him and someone told Mordecai Mordecai told the queen the queen found it out and found out it was true and hung those two men 
and that basically saved the king's life so it was written in the book of chronicles the king couldn't sleep that night before the feast uh haman had it in his mind that he wanted the he wanted to request the king that next day to have mordecai killed on the gallow hung on the gallow but the king having seen what mordecai had done in the book of the chronicles i said how ironic that he read it that same night which would which would indeed save Mordecai's life. I said, that was, that's nothing but the work of the Lord. And he said, oh, what honor and dignity has been done for Mordecai for what he has done for me in saving my life. And then someone said unto him, nothing, king. Nothing's been done for him. So the next morning, the king um, basically called Haman, who was at the court in front of the king's uh, palace. He called Mordecai, I'm sorry, not Mordecai. He called Haman to himself. Mind you, Haman had it in his mind. He's going to request that Mordecai be killed and hang. The king had it in his mind that he's going to favor Mordecai for saving his life. So Haman comes up to the king, having not requested what he wanted to do to Mordecai just yet. And the king said to Haman, he said, what shall be done unto the man whom the king delight to honor? That's what the king said to Haman. And Haman, being big-headed, thought in his heart that the king was talking about him that the king wanted to honor. So Haman, thinking that, Haman said, um, Haman said, Let the royal apparel be brought, which the king wears, and a horse that the king rides on, and a crown to be set on that person's head. And let his apparel and horse be delivered to the hand of the one of the king's most noble princes, that they may array the man with all whom the king delighted to honor, and bring him on horseback through the street of the city, and proclaim before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delighted to honor. Mind you again, Haman thought that the king was talking about him for these things to be done to him, but the king was talking about his enemy, Mordecai. Then the king said to Haman, Okay, make haste. And take the apparel and the horse, as you have said, and do this to Mordecai, the Jew, that sit at the king's uh, gate, and let nothing fall of all that you have said. Then Haman took the apparel and the horse and arrayed Mordecai and brought him on horseback through the street of the city and proclaimed before him, Thus shall it be done unto the man whom the king delight to honor. And then after that, the Mordecai just went back to the king's gate and sat there like normal. Mordecai was a very humble individual. He wasn't like um, Haman, all boastful and prideful and cocky with his nose in the air. So he just went back to the king's gate and didn't brag to anybody about anything. But Haman himself, having been grieved and mourning, he ran back to his house before his wife and his friends who he bragged about. And they basically prophesied his fall. <clears throat> he said, or it says, the wise man is after his wife. He said, if Mordecai be of the seed of the Jews before whom thou hast begun to fall, Thou shalt not prevail against him, but shalt surely fall before him, and they were right. So while they were saying these things to Haman, the chamberlains of the king came and took him and said, You need to hurry up and come. The banquet is set that the queen has made for you and the king. So they go to the banquet, and the queen and the king said, Okay, queen. I'm here now. What would you? What was your request? What was your petition? What would you like me to do for you? Like I said, I'll give you half of my kingdom. And it says the queen then said, If I found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleased the king, let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request. For we are sold and we are sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be slain, and to perish. But if we, but if we have been sold for bondmen and bondwomen, I had held my peace, although the enemy could not countervail the king's damage. So the request was for her, for the Jews to not be killed, as the letter has been sent forth. Like I said, 
The king didn't know what he was doing when he signed the letter with his ring to Haman, but Haman knew. And it's like everything worked out in their favor. Um, so she requested these things to the king. And the king said it himself, opening his eyes, he's basically saying, who will think to kill you? Who was thinking to do such a thing? And then Esther said, the adversary, an enemy, is this wicked Haman. Then Haman was afraid before the king and the queen. So Haman basically was boasting to his friends and his wife about the feast, but he didn't know it was to his own destruction. Basically, uh, vengeance. And then, as he was saying that, the king was upset. The king got up and ran into his garden furious thinking what he's going to do to this Haman for what he sought to do to now he found out Esther's a Jew to his wife's people throughout the kingdom of the providences and then to Mordecai's favor again someone stepped in and said and you know what else king this Haman made a gallow six cubits high to hang Mordecai who you had delighted to honor on that gallow and the king was angry the king said the gallow that he made hang him on there so Haman ended up being hung on that gallow um, trying to see what else and it said it pacified the king's wrath. And so what happened, what the king had done, the queen and Mordecai asked that the king reverse the letter that was sent out to the kingdoms as far as purging out the Jews and trying to kill them because for the wrath of um, Haman. So what the king had said, he told the Jews, defend yourself. Stand up against those. Gather yourselves together and stand for your life to destroy, to slay, and to cause to perish all those in the providence of the kingdom who would have sought to assault you, both little ones and women, and to take the spoil of them. And then the letters went out to be, then the letters went out to the Jews for them to be ready against the day to avenge themselves on their enemies <clears throat> who were ready to come against them to cut them off so we see the favor of the Lord working on their behalf and as if you continue to read scriptures you will see that they named this they named this particular day and I believe the Jews still in Israel still uh, celebrate that day I think it's um, Adar Adar is this a uh, remembrance of this celebration where the Jews in the providence of the Shushan the palace was almost annihilated. So, like I said, what opened up my eyes when I was reading the book of Dan, the book of uh, Esther is remembering when I read the book of Ezekiel when it speaks about Gog and Magog. Um, let me see what the verse is so I can share it with you. I didn't want to read the whole thing, but you yourself may be able to read it. So it speaks about Gog and Magog. And look at verse 11. <clears throat> it says, It came, and it shall come to pass in that day that I will give unto Gog. Okay, we know Gog is the hater of the believers, the haters of God's people. All right. And it shall come to pass. <coughs> Sorry for my voice, brethren. I lost my voice. A few days ago, and it shall come to pass in that day that I will give unto Gog a place there of graves in Israel, the valley of passengers on the east of the city, and it shall stop the noses of the passengers, and there shall they bury Gog and all his multitude, and they shall call it the valley of what? Haman Gog. All right, the same enemy of the Jews. In the book of Esther. So they named that valley. After that same Haman. Who sought to come. 
after the Jews to slay and to destroy them. Like I said, this Haman reminds me of the Antichrist and who the Lord had revealed unto us. It's like the people in these last days, they have Haman's spirit. They have Haman's spirit. But at but like um one second, what I was gonna say. But just as the Lord has given just as the Lord had given the Jews in the book of uh Esther victory over their enemies, likewise with God and may God God gives us victory over them as well. For in verse 12, it says, In seven months shall the house of Israel be burying of them, that they may cleanse the land. Yet all the people of the land shall bury them, and it shall be to them a renown, the day of the Lord, that I shall be glorified, said the Lord God. Amen. Just like the Lord was glorified in the book of Esther when the Lord came through for his people, and who mourned for three, who mourned and fast, neither ate or drank, cried out to the Lord. And in the favor of the Lord, Esther found favor in the eyes of the king. The eyes stood up, the king stood up for his queen to send a royal decree, decree to have the Jews stand up for their life and to come against all those who sought to come against them. And as you continue to read, read the book of Daniel, the Jews prevailed against all those who hated them. Those people, those people was ready to kill them for real. They didn't even have no type of sense or conscience to say, no, nah, I'm not going to hurt anyone. These people ain't do anything to me. No, these people were ready. Just like I said in these last days, if there was a purge for, um, if there was a call to come together, these nations and kingdoms, one were order to come together to come against the body of Christ, which, hold, which keep the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, these people would not hesitate to come and kill. Okay? We're dealing with, we're dealing with hatred and wrath. No love in these last days. So if the decree come to purge, they'll be ready to kill anybody at any second and not be charged for it. But just as in the times of Esther, just as in the times of Gog, God comes through for his people, period. Though in these last days it will seem as if the Lord ain't coming through because of the multitude of uh, believers being slain, this uh, this Christian holocaust that is to come to pass. In God's due time, he will stand up to fight for his people. And let me show you another verse as well. And I always rejoiced it in this uh, verse when I heard it. I said, oh, yes, Lord, muster me, muster me, please. And you will see what I'm talking about. In Isaiah chapter 13, hear this, brethren. The burden of Babylon, which Isaiah, the son of Amos, did see. Verse 2, it says, Lift you up a banner upon the high mountain. Exalt the voice unto them. Shake the hand, that they may go into the gates of the nobles. Listen what the Lord says in verse 3. Lord says, I have commanded my sanctified ones. I have also called my mighty ones for mine anger. Even them, that's us, brethren. Hold on, let me highlight this if I could. I don't think I can. No. Even them that rejoice in my highness. He's talking about us. Again, I have commanded my sanctified ones. I have also called my mighty ones for my anger. Even them that rejoice in my highness. We're talking about the last days now. Verse 4. The noise of a multitude in the mountains. He's talking about us, brethren. The noise of a multitude in the mountains, like as of a great people, a tum a tum a was it tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations gathered together, the Lord of hosts mustereth the host of the battle. He's talking about us. We're, we're, we're told when you see the abomination, flee to the mountains. Everybody's fleeing. You, we, when we hear about in the book of Revelation, the woman uh, fleed into the mountains for three and a half days where she is nourished. Know why? She's getting ready. She's getting ready for battle. After those 42 months, this is the assembly. The noise of a multitude in the mountains, like as of a great people, a, tum a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations. Gather together. 
The Lord of hosts mustered the host of battle. That's why I said, Lord, please let me be mustered. I want to be mustered. They come from a far country, from the end of heaven, even the Lord and the weapon of his indignation to destroy the whole land. This is the whole earth. Okay, again, they come from a far country. We come in from everywhere. From the end of heaven, even the Lord it is the Lord mustering his people and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole earth. Again, this this goes back to the book of Esther. That's why I said the book of Esther is important. I didn't know until the Lord showed me that it shows our future. Verse 6, and it says, How ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand, it shall come as a destruction from the Almighty, not for the body of Christ, but for those who were our enemies, the seeds of Haman, Antichrists. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt, and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrow shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners out of it. And then it tells you what we read in the book of Revelation, the sixth seal, verse 10. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And the Lord says in verse 11, And I will punish the earth for their evil, and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the pride, that's Haman and his peoples, the pride to cease, and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. Therefore I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place. That's the sixth seal, brethren, and the wrath of the Lord of hosts, and the day of his fierce wrath. What say? Yep. And it shall be as a chaste row, as a sheep that no man layeth up. They shall every man turn to his own people and flee every one to his own land. Every one that is found shall be thrust through. Every one that is joined unto them shall fall by the sword. Their children also shall be dashed to pieces before their eyes. Their houses shall be spoiled and their wives ravished. All right, this we hear about the sixth seal when the people hide in the mountains and in the rocks saying, Fall on us, hide us, for the great day of the wrath has come. This is it. This is it. The the tumult, the multitudes that's hiding in the mountains, the Lord is mustering the host for battle. And it is it is his people that's coming against them. It is vengeance. Again, this is a mirror of the book of uh, Esther. It is a mirror of the book of Esther. Where the enemies sought for a long time to come against the people, wrath against God's people. It says the beast that ascended up out of the bottomless pit wages war with the, uh, the with the witnesses. Not only wages war with the witnesses, but wages war with the saints. Where there come a time when the remaining of God's appointed uh, believers in the fifth seal are killed. God is taking vengeance in sixth seal. God is taking vengeance in sixth seal with his people. Against the people of the land. Like he said, he's going to destroy the sinners thereof. So that's why I seen how important the book of Esther is. And it's wonderful. I said, wow. To where they called the land of God after this Haman. Which is in the book of Esther. I said, this is amazing. What did he say? Therefore, thou son of man, prophesy against Gog, and say, Thus saith the Lord God. Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. I will turn thee back, and leave but the sixth part of thee. I will cause thee to come up from the north parts, and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. And I will smite thy bow out of the left hand, and will cause thine arrows to fall out of thy right hand. 
Thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel, thou and all thy bands, and the people that are with thee. I will give thee unto the ravenous birds of every sort, and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. Thou shalt fall upon the open field, for I have spoken it, says the Lord God. I will send a fire on Magog, and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So will I make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them pollute my holy name any more. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. Behold, it come, and it shall, and it is done, said the Lord. Listen to that. That, that reminds me of the book of Revelation. When the Lord says, it is done. Verse 8. Behold, it is come, and it is done, said the Lord God. This is the day whereof I have spoken. And they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth and shall set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and the bucklers, the bows and the arrows, and the handstaves and the spears, and they shall burn them with seven ye burn them with fire seven years, so that they shall take no wood out of the field, neither cut down any out of the forest, for they shall burn the weapons with fire, and they shall spoil those that spoil them. Again we read that about we read that in the book of uh, Esther. The Jews end up spoiling the people that wanted to spoil them so badly. They shall spoil those that spoil them and rob those that rob them, says the Lord. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will give unto Gog a place there of graves in Israel, the valley of passengers on the east of the sea, and it shall stop the noses of passengers. And there shall they bury Gog and all his multitude, and they shall call it the valley of Haman Gog. Amen. And if you read also in the in the book of Esther, it's amazing how I seen that too. Hold on, let me see. Um It's amazing how I said, Wow, what what really is a Jew? I wanna let you see that. Let me find that and then um I'll show it to you. Let's see what you think about it. I'm just gonna read slightly um a further person further portion of the uh book of Esther. To show the victory of the Jews over their enemies who sought to kill them in the kingdom um, by the decree of Haman, who had already been killed. But I remember reading somewhere in the scriptures where when all of these were happening, a lot of the people who were against the Jews, they themselves uh, became Jews. And I say, how could that be if it's something that's like um, you have to be born a Jew? But and that's what it says in scriptures. Some of them. They became Jews. So it is true in scriptures where Apostle Paul said a Jew is not one outwardly but inwardly. This is like um, if something like this happened to us and the Lord stood up and defended us and the people seen that God was for us. And a lot of people convert over to Christianity. The true Christianity. Biblical Christianity. All right. And yes, God does recognize Christianity. I had dreams where the Lord spoke, said, Lord and angels, they said Christians, Christians. And they spoke about one that is truly like a coming out of the root of Christ himself. All right. So I'm just going to go over here this briefly so you would uh, see the victory and just mirror it to our victory in these last days. So we don't fret ourselves and or lose heart because, again, this is our future. Now, in the 12th month, that is the month of Adar on the 13th day of the same when the king's commandment and his decree drew near to be put in execution in the day that the enemies of the Jews hoped to have power over them, though it was turned to their contrary, that the Jews had rule over them that hated them. The Jews gathered themselves together in their cities throughout all the providence of, of the king Azurus to lay hand on such as sought their hurt. And no man could withstand them, for the fear of them fell upon all people. And, all, and that says that again. Wow, that's another verse in scriptures. That spoke about something like that for and it shows our victory as well. And all the rulers of the providence and the lieutenants and the deputies and the officers of the king helped the Jews because of the fear of Mordecai fell upon them. And, you know, Mordecai was appointed, y'all, for Mordecai was great in the king's house and his fame went out throughout all the providence for this man. Mordecai waxed greater and greater. Thus the Jews smote all their enemies with the stroke of the sword and slaughter and destruction and did what they would unto those that hated them. And in Shushan the palace, the Jews slew and destroyed 500 men. Verse 10, the ten sons of Haman, the son of Hamadiah, the enemy of the Jews, slew they. But on a spoil laid 
laid they not their hand. On that day, the number of those that were slain in Shushan the palace was brought before the king. And the king said unto Esther the queen, The Jews have slain and destroyed five hundred men in Shushan the palace, and the ten sons of Haman. What have they done in the rest of the king's providence? Now what is thy petition? And it shall be granted thee. Or what is thy request further? It shall be done. It shall be done. You know what, uh... As you were, now reminds me of by allowing the queen to do such things. I, as you were, reminds me of Christ. Just in that moment, it reminds me of Christ and uh, in the Father. And Esther reminds me of the church, the body of Christ. So the body of Christ is taking vengeance on their enemies. And the Father and the Son is like, what else do you want? What else would you like? Or Christ could be part of the church as well, since he is the cornerstone and is the father that reminds me of Hazuerus when he's granting his son. What else would you like me to do for your enemies? Just as the father has said unto his son, sit at my right hand until I place your enemies beneath your feet. And now he has placed his enemies beneath his feet. He's asking the son. He's asking the church. Well, what else would you like your father to do for you? I will do it for you. Verse 13, then said Esther, if it please the king, let it be granted to the Jews which are in Shushan to do tomorrow also according unto this day's decree. And let Haman's ten sons be hanged upon the gallows. And the king commanded it so to be done. And the decree was given at Shushan that they hang Haman's ten sons. For the Jews that were in Shushan gathered themselves together on the fourteenth day also of the month of Adar and slew three hundred men at Shushan, but on the but on the prey they laid not their hand. But the other Jews that were in the king's providences gathered themselves together and stood for their lives, and they had a, and they had a rest from their enemies and slew of their foes seventy and five thousand. But they laid not their hands on their prey. On the thirteenth day of the month, Adar, and on the fourteenth day of the same rest day, and made it a day of feasting and gladness. That reminds of us. Uh, uh, that reminds us of us, brethren. But the Jews that were at Shushan assembled themselves on the thirteenth day thereof, and on the fourteenth day thereof, and on the fifteenth day, the same they rested, and made it a day of feasting and gladness. <laughs> Therefore the Jews of the village that dwelt in the unwalled towns made the fourteenth day of the month Adar a day of gladness and feasting, a day of good day, and of sending portions one to another. And Mordecai wrote these things and sent letters unto all the Jews that were in all the province of the king Azuerus, both nigh and far, to establish this among them, that they should keep the fourteenth day of the month Adar, and the fifteenth day of the same yearly, as the days wherein the Jews rested from their enemies in the month which was turned unto them for sorrow to joy, from morning into a good day, that they should make them days of feasting and joy, and of sending portions one to another, and gifts to the poor. And the Jews undertook to do as they had begun, and Mordecai had written unto them, Because Haman, the son of Hamadath, the Agite, the enemy of all the Jews, had devised against the Jews to destroy them, and had cast purr, that is the lot, to consume them, to destroy them. But Esther came before the king. He commanded by letters that his wicked device, which he devised against the Jews, should return upon his own head, and that he and his sons should be hanged on the gallows. Wherefore they called these they called these days Purim, as after the name of Pur. Therefore, for all the words of this letter, and of which they had seen concerning this matter, and which had come unto them, the Jews ordained and took upon them, and upon their seed, and upon all such as joined themselves unto them, so as it should not fail that they would keep these two days according to their writing, and according to their appointed time every year, and that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation, every family, every province, every city, and that these days of Purim should not fail from among the Jews, nor the memorial of them perish from their seed. Why? Because it's going to happen again. Then Esther the queen, the daughter of Abel, and Mordecai the Jew, wrote with all authority to confirm this second letter of Purim. And he sent the letters unto all the Jews, to the hundred twenty and seven providence of the kingdom, Hazuerus, with words of peace and truth, to confirm these days of Purim in these times appointed according, according as Mordecai the Jew and Esther the queen had enjoined them, as they have decreed for themselves and for their seed the matters of fastings and their cry. And a decree of Esther confirmed these matters of Purim, and it was written in the book. Let me find where I see where the Jews had conferred. People had converted themselves over to Jews. One second. All right. We'll look at uh, verse 17. 
me see if I can highlight that. Yep. Look at verse 17. It says, And in every providence and in every city, wheresoever the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a good day. And many of the people of the land became Jews, for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. Hear that. So it's not necessarily a born of uh, someone that's born and you said, oh, I'm a Jew. It's literally for real. It's one in the heart. As Apostle Paul said, a Jew is one inward. So these people were converted over to being Jews. And many of the people of the land became Jews. How do you become a Jew at that time? They became Jews. For the fear of the Jews fell upon them. Just like I said, it's like a believer. They may very well say many of the people became believers. Many of the people became Christians. Many of the people became followers of Christ for the believers. Because the fear and respect of believers fell upon them. For God was on their side, truly. But um, I'm thankful that the Lord led me to that. And I had this three months ago. But it came to my thought again, so I'm grateful the Lord put it in my heart to share with you all, brethren. But yes, this is something that is to come to pass again. And like the other day that I shared with you all, I had a dream where it was revealed to me that uh, these last days, uh, Israelites are those who separate themselves from the world. They're separate from the world. They're like God's commandment is truly in their heart. And they, they do not, like the Jews had done in the uh, book of Esther, they do not hold on to the laws of the land. They hold on to the laws of God. Everything, their mannerism is of God. Even Esther. Esther was brought up under the law of God. And that's why the king had found so much favor in her because she was different. She was different, raised according to the the good law of the Lord our God. So I thought I'd share this with you all, brethren. And I pray y'all take care.